really want to look at emotional resilience with the work that we're doing and just allowing you to check in a bit more, especially when we are not able to check in right now, maybe with friends or family in, in a deep way, maybe get respite in a profound way, other than just, you know, maybe leaving our houses or our apartments and going for a quick prescribed walk. It's okay. I know someone's drawing. I quite like drawing. So don't worry about drawing on the slides. Uh, I'm going to draw a little bit more in a moment. So I just want you to take a moment to just think about how you're doing and really kind of ask you again just to think about in chat you know why are you here really so you know you know why are you here do you find it difficult to support someone are you finding it challenging um do you find that it's exhausting at times is it something that you know makes you happy and has brought you closer together or at times you know you maybe feel guilty because you, you may have had an experience of cancer personally in life, you might not. But you know, we, and again, you don't have to answer all those things. Well, that's quite honest. And is it easy to be honest, you know, at times like, um, I guess, you know, a child being diagnosed, that's, you know, something, you know, I, I have not experienced and I will never be able to experience that one because I don't have children, but, you know, it's very, very challenging, right? One thing I'm going to say just about, um, yeah, please do. Someone has said, you know, we want to hear other perspectives, love to hear other perspectives. So if anyone wants to talk, please feel free to unmute yourself and um, get in there. You can find it lonely at times. Yes. And it, it's interesting as well, you know, getting the support that we need. And someone else sort of mentioned you know, a son with you know, leukemia. Uh, really difficult at you know, with child leukemia and uh, also with all these issues, it's really important to recognize that we need connection as individuals. Yeah, good. So we're gonna take a look at this framework, but one thing I will never forget, and my partner was very, very good and is very good at allowing uh, these conversations to happen, but I'll never forget, and I hope you all have one of these friends. Sadly, this friend of mine has suffered a massive stroke, but she's still alive. But I never forget when my partner was diagnosed over 12 years ago. She was one of the first people to say, Paul, I need to know. And I was like, what, what, what? She was very insistent. She said, I need to know how you are doing. And that floored me. And she said, I know you, I've known you since you're you know, early 20s, how are you? And because of that lack of insight from many people that were around me, also the lack of time that I'd ever really spent uh, looking inward, it was a very important question in my, in my life. So yes, one of the main things you will need and we all need is to talk to someone. Counseling is very important. So whether it's a GP or a friend, professional help can help you. But also I know as a partner and someone who loves my partner very deeply. And even I remember being a friend and a teenager and a friend of mine was diagnosed with cancer. Thankfully, he's, he's still alive. It's very difficult when you can't fix it. And I just want you to think about that, that there's certain things you can't fix. And thank you for putting all that work in chat. But one of the questions I do want to ask you to think about is, what do you think about supporting a loved one? Can people just like, what do you think about this? This role that you're in and maybe not be, a role, I mean, it's a role that I would never want anyone else to have. You know, I don't want anyone I know ever to have cancer. I don't want anyone to have cancer, but you know, it's also something I, w I don't think I'd want anyone else to do, but I would, I'd ask, I want to ask you one question now. What do you think about supporting a loved one? Exhausting. Other things? That's very honest. That's very true. Any other thoughts? Because some people might say it's fine. Some people might say it's not fine. Trying to support, right? Getting it wrong. So someone's saying they're doing it wrong but you're doing it. So I, I would challenge you about whether you're getting it right or wrong because you're actually doing it. Don't forget, there's not always a right and wrong with this. Good, nothing seems enough. Good. Uh, one of the things that's come through, but don't wanna say the wrong things at times, w when we're looking at this kind of work and really trying to 
give ourselves a break around it. You have to accept at times you will you realistically, what's logical, what's realistic and what's helpful. And I worked on this with the men's session a little bit. This is called cognitive behavioral work. This is, I'm a cognitive behavioral coach. What's logical, what's realistic and what's helpful. And those are questions you always have to ask yourself when you're coaching other people. But also we have very negative beliefs that creep in and it's logical and realistic and helpful to expect that you will occasionally get it wrong. That is logical, that is realistic and it is helpful to help. Good. Unpredictable. Difficult to plan. Difficult long distance. Good. Life is a role. Now I'm just going to shift the question slightly. Same question, but a slightly more important thing. And thank you for putting that all into chat. But I want to know in chat, how do you feel? Because if there's a difference between thoughts and that versus feelings. So Oh, just this is a bit more deeper work. You know, we all know if you ask someone, how do you, what do you think about today? Or what do you think about the session? You go, oh, it's fine, it, or it's good, or it's bad. Generally, the answer is either pleasant or unpleasant. But if you want to go deeper, you know, you think about feeling. What are you actually feeling? And is it a thought? Is it a thought? Um, the challenge, I'm going to challenge someone right now. People would say, life is no choice. So one of the things I do want to think about is that generally, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the amygdala. This is some, these are some hard things I'm saying right now. And this is where cognitive behavioral work is quite, can be quite challenging because it's about confronting some of the stuff. Generally, you know, you really, the world is full of little choice. The external events of our life in the world are really an area of no choice. What we do have to then look at, and this is really where emotions can be very difficult because emotional reactions and triggers are, are really kind of strong. And so what we want to think about with this is there's plenty of stuff in this, in this life and I'm not demeaning or belittling what people have gone through. You know, I've been there, I'm maybe in a different context, you know, different relationship um, and a different type of cancer. But I do want you to think about that that one of the scary things about cancer is, you know, it's a journey that you're on, whether you like it or not. And so that can be quite difficult, but I want to think about emotions here. And so, I've, yeah, I'm just gonna, I'm looking at some of these contributions and I want you to recognize that you are useful. It's hard, but it's, and frustration is a, an emotion that's linked to anger. So when we start to think about using words like frustration, it's a very important thing. You have the right to be angry. Every right comes responsibility. And I'm using these words very specifically because responsibility, whenever we assert a right, like I have the right not to be ripped off, I have the right not to have someone attack me. I have the right to be angry and upset at times, but if we're gonna be assertive with it, and again, I'm putting this into chance, we have to think about when do we react to situations and how can I respond a little bit more effectively? And as well as people are also putting their, um, people are putting in the contributions about the other stresses and strains in life. To help, and I'm just putting this in, these are the, all I'm doing is doing what's called cognitive behavioral work, okay? And it just helps. But I also work a lot with people in different backgrounds. Whenever we ask questions, you have to be careful about the type of question you ask. Whenever we ask why, we're gonna be moving into victim mode. And I know no one here is a victim, okay? But victim is very much linked to anger. You are, we are our most angry when we are our most victimized. So whenever you ask the why question, you're probably going to find it difficult to get an answer. We ask why to get context. Okay. A more powerful question is to ask yourself how or what. So what can I do? What are the needs here? How can I help? How can I move forward? It's very important. And again, do seek help if you are getting uh, feeling that you're getting unstuck, especially with the pressures that people are saying with other kids, there may be financial issues you're going through. Um, and all of us are feeling strain and stress outside of the cancer support. 
with COVID and it will build up and up and up. Anger is normal and natural. However, really what I want to really impose on you in terms of a, and it's, you know, I'm using very specific language here, is moving away from the reactive brain or the emotional brain to the more responsive brain. And don't worry, what you are doing is very, very natural. And it's very important when suddenly our lives are placed into a real struggle and stress and we feel we don't have any control, that all these things that you're saying are completely normal. And so I really want to ask you to also think about as a carer, and I'm looking you all in the eye, that you need to forgive yourself. It's called Ray, R-A-I. Be responsible. So R is for responsible. Be responsible for what you're saying. A is for accept. Accept how you think at times is going to be wrong. But the I to me is very powerful and you are innocent and we're all innocent. We do the best we can at times. But just thinking when we get stuck in our thoughts, really your thoughts aren't real. They are just thoughts and they're generally natural and normal. But do think about that we sometimes own our thoughts a little bit too much and we think we are our thoughts and thoughts are just thoughts. My partner, despite his leukemia and his great fatigue, has painted pretty much our entire flat, right? It's great. I can start thinking about different colors and swatches. Those thoughts are entering my head randomly. If I suddenly go, why am I worrying about these, this, this paint? Doesn't matter. It's just a thought. Let it go and start to just give yourself an understanding of where these emotions and the deeper questions are, how are you feeling, rather than just what we're thinking. Because thoughts, I think it's uh, about 20,000 thoughts, if not more per day that we have, that's quite a lot to keep track of. So I just want you to think about giving you a bit more understanding around emotional resilience. I'll give you a very quick framework. This is just a useful definition around emotional intelligence, and we all have emotional intelligence. But when we're tired, when we're hungry, when we've got three or four kids and other responsibilities, our emotions can sometimes get a bit fraught. So it's not about controlling your emotions. A lot of research would say that researchers would say that's impossible. And I can give you reference materials if you're interested in some of the studies. But it's looking at about just developing some self-awareness. This other secondary thing around interpersonal relationships judiciously, it's very official. For me, that's about understanding how do I interact with other people, interpersonal relationships? Am I doing it in a rational way at times? You know, so using the judgment of the ages or the judgment that I have in practice in my life, it's not about judging people, it's more about just judging situations and, and using empathy a bit more. I mean, the people you're supporting, you're probably giving a lot of empathy. But this framework can just help you look at other areas that you could use just to help someone mention things like self-awareness and motivation. So I talked briefly about this whole thing about the reaction. The, the human brain is fascinating and very unique, our mammal brain. I'm sure we've heard of the fight or flight and that is the reactive brain and it will generate through the limbic system. The limbic system is the largest system in our brain in terms of size and it's the emotional centers of our brain. So as we see something, we obviously get a bit stimulated. And the amygdala, which is moving on your screen right now, is Greek for the word almond. And that's because you have two of these amygdalas in either hemisphere of your brain. And it was discovered in the 1970s, uh, late 60s, early 70s, the experiment started. And this is the fear center. It stores information. And what happens is, is we see something through our eyes, we process all this information, and then we see something and we don't like it. And then this stimuli enters the brain and goes directly into the amygdala. So as it travels through the thalamus, there's a shortcut and it goes straight to the amygdala. So what can take two to three seconds for the brain to process, it can actually within milliseconds stimulate the amygdala. And 14% uh, of our brain mass is actually all about responsive behaviors. And this is the largest proportion of any animal for its brain size, that we have this neocortex and the large part of the executive. And that's the responsive part of the brain. It's the one that takes a few moments to respond. But the challenge is emotion gets generated very, very quickly. And that's the reactive part of the brain. This is called the fight or flight. 
and what is happening now, and it's happening because of COVID, and is natural to happen when people are going through trauma, and especially when you are getting diagnosed or going through a diagnosis, you have, I'm sure people have heard of PTSD, you know, but GAD is what's happened at the moment with uh, society. They're saying right now, everyone is either experiencing or has experienced in the last 12 months, some form of what's called GAD, and that's generalized anxiety disorder. May have been for a very short period of time, but they're finding this more and more. What GAD is about is you're actually just living in fight or flight. Everything's fight or flight. You're no longer having the capacity emotionally to start to make decisions. So this framework is just to remind you of how the brain works on an anatomical level. And the great thing in the last 30 years, especially if any of you have heard of emotional intelligence and the work of Daniel Goleman and other practitioners, Another one I like is uh, Feldman Barnett, um, Interoception. There's some fascinating work that's going on about the brain, how it reacts, and they're able to actually look at this in operation. If you are interested, there's a great book. Uh, it's the sequel for emotional intelligence called Destructive Emotions with the Dalai Lama and Daniel Goleman, and where they actually have monks being MRI scanned and how they're stimulating their brains. Just want you to be aware that you will get hijacked. This amygdala hijack or the emotional hijack happens you know, when these things occur. And especially when you're supporting someone when they have appointments or scans, tests. I see it with my partner when you know maybe something gets where it was on a six month rotation, moves to a three month rotation. Suddenly a day or two before things get a bit fraught in a relationship or I'm suddenly noticing certain people aren't paying any attention to the fact the scans are happening. And you know, then it can be quite upsetting when they don't call or they don't inquire, especially long-term, obviously anniversaries, milestones in people's lives, graduations, celebrations, now not even be able to attend those uh, because, you know, and even with the celebration of this virus, whether or not people will actually, from the cancer community or other people with other health issues, even be allowed to access the, those um, vaccines and stuff. So. I'd just like to check in with people because I've been, you know, some great contributions now. And I'm just giving you some information, really, just to try and structure your thinking. The important thing around emotional issues, I'm not denying them, nor do I want you to feel defeated by them. What everyone's been saying is a truth and it's your truth. And I really need you to own that. And I would never take that away. What I would like you to think about is to help if it, if it helps. If it doesn't, ignore it, right? Do what you need to do. But just think a little bit about that the brain doesn't do well with structure in an emotional situation. So even just writing things down, keeping a journal, doing an email and maybe not sending it straight away, but maybe sending it a bit later helps. Stepping back from anxiety ridden spaces like social media. Again, my partner just came off of Facebook recently and is so happy, so happy. Because, you know, we, uh, we've all seen the temperature go up with COVID, uh, with political situations and instability that's been happening. Even Brexit. I mean, I don't know how you guys feel, but waking up after five years of either certain political pundits grabbing the mic or Brexit being on my radar every day since 2015, that this last few weeks I've woken up and there's, the, the temperature's gone down a little bit. And so even though COVID is there and temperature may be going up because of concerns around health and shielding. I've been, uh, my and my partner have been pretty much shielding and self-isolating since March. Um, it's challenging, it can be even more challenging, especially with say Hanukkah or Christmas coming up and other celebrations. So I just want you to also notice though in the news and social media in the last few weeks, you may have found that temperature's gone down a little bit in certain ways. So. An intervention is just to think a little bit around this. I just would like to ask people to put into chat, like when do you get hijacked? Maybe thinking about the, to give you something practical to hold on to. Think maybe over the last two weeks overall, what's been the subject or maybe some events that have caused you to react or that you see maybe sensitive touch points in the relationship between you and the person you're supporting? People wouldn't mind sharing. Again, I will keep it confidential, meaning I won't say your name just to kind of give you that kind of confidentiality, but yeah, can people just put in chat? You know, I sort of mentioned sort of scans. 
Um, but when do you get when do you get hijacked by this kind of stress or the emotions? So for me, it's you know a part of scan. Returning to work, yeah, that's going to be very difficult because you may also we've had stuff around. I've had to turn down work or postpone work because whether I'd need to go into quarantine. Um, it's a conversation me and my partner had, and I was willing to do it, but that's taken a long time. Yeah, waiting for scan results. Yes, um, and going in for surgery, MRI cycle, good. And that's good to know. So those patterns someone said about, you know, a week or two before, notice the patterns and maybe what do you need in terms of support? Um, maybe what you, the person you're supporting needs, you're know, waiting for treatment to start. It seems too long. Yes, and my partner is on watch and wait. And that's the only provision that my partner has. And, you know, that's close to 12 years now, but things still progress. And, you know, when is the, the tipping point going to happen? Yeah, and, and okay, so on that, this is a really good point. A professional face, I, it's not recommended, okay? It's not recommended. It's called emotional labor. Uh, this is a concept that comes out of emotional intelligence, which I'm going to give you a, a framework on in a moment, um, just while we're sort of reflecting, and please keep those chats coming in. But emotional labor is an important thing to think about, and it is exhausting. I don't know, if, a quick aside, if any of you ever worked in retail, I worked in retail in Canada for many years. I still work in the States a lot, and this work came out of retail sales. Have a nice day. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. My day is awful. The concept around emotional labor really came forward when business leaders sort of said, why are my staff always grouchy? And it was because uh, they were really having to put on something that wasn't congruent and consistent with their whole system. So the body doesn't like to kind of lie to itself. So do you think about if you're going into a professional situation, when will you get support and think about safety of that support? So maybe only one colleague or one person that you can safely speak to. I'll be very careful about, you know, obviously, and I, I'm assuming you don't want to hijack or bring in these very personal things, but, you know, a little bit of intimacy with the colleague and someone that you trust can, can be very helpful. And, you know, if you're not having a great day, owning that very quickly and very um, fully is quite important. Good. Um, nice. And some people are sort of talking about sort of WhatsApp and all that stuff's good. So um, around that WhatsApp, stuff are we just really talking about you know how you give and get support because i quite like those quick chats myself occasionally with other people but also you know having a safe place to speak to someone i even speak to my mom a lot even though she's been supporting my dad with dementia you know she's very good but to be fair she was a cardiac nurse and worked in icu so she was quite used to having those conversations but she still needs that support supporting my father's dementia and she's very very proactive in ensuring that I get that support from her. So just a quick toolkit because we're moving into sort of the last half hour. With this it can seem quite big and there is quite a lot in there but really all I'd ask you to think about before we explore it and again feel free to ask questions because there's a lot of work in this. This is used a lot in workplaces around what's called emotional competency. So are you actually capable and competent with an emotional framework? And I'm giving this to you to just help you build resilience. I don't generally coach people to think of all five. It gets very confusing. And unless you want to do a doctorate on it, I really wouldn't bother. I would more readily look at what areas do I have strength in? What areas do I need to develop? An emotionally unintelligent approach to any framework is to go, I'm excellent at all of this. Because we can have a toolkit, which I'm giving you, but you won't always be able to apply it to so the skill set may be slightly different. It's more about being mature and being honest and aware that you can at certain days be good at certain things and not so good at other things. And that's okay. And to have an open conversation around that with people you can trust or, or even most importantly with yourself. So we're looking at self. This is, there's some arrows going around, but don't treat it like a flow chart. You know, don't treat it that way. Emotions, don't behave like that, so nor should you. It's just more just saying that these all build on each other, but it's all about developing yourself and where you are right now. So enter this however you feel comfortable. I'm not gonna read all this out to you because I want you to just look at them as ideas, not a prescriptive list. And you know, these are just ideas to allow you to think a little bit more around what you do and how you do it. 
I'm just going to pick up a few things that for a lot of people can be quite challenging. Optimism is not about being happy. Oh, it's a great day. It's actually more about having grounded optimism or pragmatic optimism to go, okay, yeah, if the diagnosis isn't good, what can we do to help and support this individual, okay? Or what can we look forward to in the short term? Do we have some nice activities planned and those types of things, okay? Um, service orientation, this is about generally people find they have better emotional resilience when they feel that they can serve others. So, and people who generally score higher on empathy tend to feel that they are there to give service to people. They're not there to take service from others. So just be very careful at times that you're not feeling worn out by over-serving other people. Because I worked in care, I used to work with people with long-term disabilities, both in Canada and as a residential counselor and volunteer coordinator here in London for about two or three years. With this, it's more about looking at how we actually are orientating do I expect people to serve me or do I expect that? Yeah, I would, I, I think it's better to help others. And I know with people who have kids, you're kind of constantly serving them, but it's more about looking and influencing other people to actually say, right, I'm going to empathize with you, but I'd expect some empathy back. So if I'm going to provide service to you that, you know, you should feel obligated to ask them to give you something. Um, be very, very careful of takers. I'm going to say this. There is a thing on here, which I love. There was a recent TV show I loved. Be careful of emotional vampires. And these are people that will suck you for your resources dry. And, you know, the there are some myths around emotional intelligence about being nice all the time. No, it's about knowing your limits, knowing your own self-regulation, and also political awareness as well. Around this, what we're thinking, whenever I am dealing with relationships where they get slightly political, you may be dealing with emotional vampires, people who are trying to suck all the emotion away from you or trying to um, manipulate you. So just be very careful because empathy is quite important, but the more, the more I am emotionally vulnerable, you have to be conscious about how much time I give to that relationship. So with politics, I always think about relationship and timing. When will I ask for things? When will I avoid certain conversations? If they're important, I'll have them later. That's a timing issue. And then relationship. I am not gonna be everyone's best friend. I know that, even though I really, really, really enjoy people's company. But um, yeah, this is nice as well. People it's coming up here, we call these people uh, uh, radiators, yeah. Right, so people are sucking things out or draining you. And so, yeah. All that stuff's really important. But again, with political awareness, relationship, can we improve the relationship or neutralize it? We just don't want to make it worse. So it's neutralize or improve. And then timing. I may not talk about it here, but I'll talk about it later. And that moves on to self-control and regulation. And things like social skills, like are you good at influencing people? Do you, are you good at communication or do you avoid it? Can you manage conflict? There's so much in there. Um, What's the team capabilities? And by team capabilities, I think about think about your family, think about the team that's actually supporting you, the medical team, um, as much as your specialist, as much as your friends and family around you. So this is just giving you some high level insight into what we mean by it. But just to give you quick definitions, stop me if I'm going fast, because I would like you to think about, again, where are you strong on this? Where are you a bit more challenged on this? You as best as you can assess yourself. So self-aware, do you have a good self-awareness of your internal state, things that you like and don't like, resources, and I'm talking about emotional resources, psychological resources, as well as intuition. Can you sense from a situation based on your life experience using your stomach more? This is called the first brain, your stomach, the first brain. This is our second brain that, you know, we, we Develop this one first. There's some more work I can tell you about that if you're interested. Really feeling in your waters which way this boat is going to go. That's what we're looking at with intuitive intelligence. Looking at almost surveying everything, but based on usually it's based on a lot more um, nonverbal signals as well as own personal experiences. Self awareness. Moving on to motivation. Do you know, like if I agree to do a project with someone or I agree to do a day out with someone? Do I actually know when I'm really 
not going to even follow through with that. Um, so what are those emotional tendencies and what guides you or facilitates you reaching that goal? Or do you give up quite easily? So if you do, then maybe you're committing to the wrong goals. Empathy, awareness of other people's feelings, their needs, their concerns. From their point of view, not yours, right? Uh, I call it the great British insult and it made me giggle when I first moved here. I was in a room full of people and this person left and they went, oh, bless him. And I was, my parents were religious. They came from a religious background. They're now like atheists, but totally different story. But I said, like, what are you talking about? Are you blessing people? Like, what are you doing? And they said, oh, bless them. And I started noticing that people were blessing people after they walked out of a room. Like, I'm just like, oh, that's kind of an interesting observation. And that to me was sympathy. Like, oh, I'm so glad I'm not them. Or you're lucky you're not them. That to me is sympathy, right? And it's fine. We can be sympathetic to people. But empathy is, are you really able, you know, as Atticus Finch said, to step into someone's skin and walk around for the day. And I'm talking about your clinician, you know, as much as the person that you're supporting, as much as you really just starting to see quite deeply what, you know, people all have emotions. We may come from different cultures, different languages, have different bad days, but are you really able to take the, it's, it's an act of imagination and of creativity. And guess what? No matter how much life experience you have, you're not gonna get all of it. You know, there's gonna be certain things we have to accept we won't be able to understand completely. Um, social skills, you know, but a great way to kind of understand someone, again, when I work with people with disabilities, especially physical impairments that were caused through illness or disease, one of the best things that I used to always say is, tell me a little bit about, you know, why you're in a wheelchair or why you have mobility impairments. Do you want to talk about it? And generally, most people did. And, you know, the great thing about Shine is people do want to talk about the cancer diagnosis at times, or some days they don't want to. You know, so, but am I able to just know and recognize how to get people engaged and, you know, forget about cancer for a day or even two, or get them to talk about it because I can see that they need it. And then finally, self-regulation. Um, the best way to assess this, if you want a nice learning point on telly, my favorite guilty indulgence, don't tell anyone, is come dine with me. And on come dine with me, they cast an individual generally who has poor self-regulation. They, they, the line out of their mouth usually is, oh, I say it and I, I see it and I say it. I say it and I see that. It's just the way I is. And that's an indication of impulsivity. That's a really quick indication of low emotional intelligence. Um, and we all have that at times. I mean, what time is it? Because as soon as I have a drink, my self-regulation goes down and keep me off of Amazon. But I just want you to think about impulsivity is quite a nice thing to just recognize. So on that in chat, I've just went through that very briefly because we're coming to the last 20 minutes or so. Where would people put uh, strength? And I'll, I'll put those definitions out just while we do this, but what is your strength and what's an area of challenge for you that you find very difficult at times? And I'll just go back here to give you this, just putting into chat, like as I mentioned, mine is, um, I think a strength of mine is I'm very good at empathy. I think I'm pretty good at it. I don't always demonstrate it, but I'm pretty good at it. Um, but uh, self-regulation, sometimes when I get emotional or when I get tired, that's my challenge. Regulation is my challenge. Uh, sorry, I'm bad typist. Yeah, empathy is for me a patient. So where would you put that um, in the framework? Let's just put it in the framework if you can. Where would that sit? Because to me, patience is possibly a little bit about self-regulation, but self-awareness could be quite an interesting thing. Like I'm, I, you know, I'm saying right now I'm a bit impatient. That's a nice sort of mood or feeling, and so that might fit into there a bit more. Good strength, self-awareness. Good. So challenge on this one is challenge is self-awareness. So good, just knowing that, and then strength is. Empathy, great, great, great. Because remember, you know, it's not about beating yourself up. It's saying like, I've got some strength here, but I also have areas where, especially when things get a little bit strained, you can think of it like an elastic, especially when, you know, we don't want it to snap, can be useful. Empathy, sometimes a problem, good, yeah, because people, and also you may not be getting a lot of empathy from other people because they don't see it. Great, so that's fine. And, and then again, that lack of empathy for other people then might knock into your motivation. So you may want to just separate those. And this is why this framework is quite useful. Good. But remember, we want, and I'm going to show you something at the, um, you know, as we move into sort of better practice and stuff 
around all this. Good. Nice. It, all I want you to do. Yeah, and it's difficult to get empathy, but also remember empathy doesn't show up. Um, so you will have to ask for it at times as well. I know there's a cultural thing. It's, you know, I come from, Britain is very much, and I love Britain. I've been here 25 years, pledge allegiance to the queen and all her heirs, but Britain is considered an implicit society. I come from an explicit society. And this is an important thing around how we ask for help. So a lot of information is implied. So it's not what you say, it's how you say it in Britain. Um, and also, uh, you know, by me saying to you, I'm having a very difficult day, then I'm implying that, um, you know, I'm, I'm being very explicit, saying I'm having a very difficult day, but I'm implying that I would need you to help me. You have the ritual around, hi, hi, how are you? Fine. It's a cultural ritual. It's, it's an important thing. I don't want to get rid of it. But you sometimes have to subvert that and be a bit explicit and say, I do need help. Um, you know, North America, we can be very explicit, help me, help me, help me, or I need this, I want this, can I get? But also there are times where I will need to imply things because, you know, other than what we've seen in the last five to 10 years, you know, people in North America are actually really polite. Just want you to think about if you're not getting what you need, you'll have to change your approach. And this is a bumper sticker I'm about to say. It's a bumper sticker I don't like. Everyone knows what I mean by bumper sticker, right? Put it at the back of the car. North Americans, we love them. It gives us moments of truth, but this could be a bit of a platitude or a non sequitur. But if you always do the same behavior, you're always gonna generally get the same outcome. So if you want a different outcome, you're gonna have to change your behavior. I can't control other people, okay? I cannot control other people. If you think you can, good luck. I can persuade and influence people. And, and when I used to do a lot of facilitation around anger and anger management sessions, one of the main things I always saw is a trend, and it's just my anecdotal, not clinical, because I'm not qualified as a therapist. You know, I'm a cognitive behavioral qualified coach and experienced in that. I'm not a therapist. But my anecdotal research really was, or experience was, that people that generally showed up had very strong control issues. And, and when I say to them, can I control you? They'd go, no. I'd say, but do you believe you can control someone else? They go, I should be able to. And when you're starting to think in those imperative ways, just be very, very careful because the world will not deliver you what you expect. And, and that's the truth in everyone's life. So what I do want you to start to think about is starting to challenge using those keywords I used before, what's logical in any given situation. And again, I covered this with the guys the other day, what's logical, what's realistic, and what's helpful. Those are the three key verbs or thoughts, you know, using logic, thinking about the reality and what's realistic, but it only really, I only use one of these, sorry, I, my typing's dreadful. What's logical, what's realistic, and finally, what's helpful. And certain, but be aware, developing yourself always comes with a little bit of irritation. Moving outside of your comfort zone can be irritating. I'm not gonna go through all this because there's some work you can find online around this. Um, I've got this because I'm doing an accredited uh, resilience practitioner course at the moment. But these are just some really interesting thoughts around building resilience for the long term. I've already talked about grounded optimism. Um, things about dealing with a fear and stuff and, and pushing through all that. Looking at brain fitness can help and your own physical fitness. This is quite important right now, particularly in lockdown because we're having to be forced to do things that can be quite challenging. And sometimes, you know, I used to travel a lot with work and I had loads of thoughts around that, but I was working with a gentleman yesterday and he uh, lost all his uh, travel. And that gave him real me meaning and purpose particularly when he needed to leave the home because his wife and kids uh, sometimes were, you know, he loved going to new offices with his business and he loved his job because of the amount of travel he did. But, you know, he spent the last three months re-examining his meaning and purpose. So this is a lot more deep, deeper work, but this is just some ideas you can have. And these slides will be available on SlideShare or through LinkedIn and, and Emma and the Connect uh, 2020 team uh, will have access to these slides if you're interested. Um, but I really just want to remind you that this is, and I am sending you love. I don't mean to jump through that. A little bit of love out there. It's always helpful. 
but the skill set portion, which we've already explored, these are some insight questions you can ask yourself to develop in these different areas. So just starting to allow yourself some insight into who you are and how you think. Motivation can be sometimes very difficult, especially um, when we're looking at the way we're looking at tasks and things we need to do. So, you know, sometimes if I see thing, something is too easy, I can actually, I can lose my motivation. That's too easy. I don't really want to do it now. I'll do it later. I'll kick it down the road. Or if it's difficult, you know, just ask yourself, why is that? And then again, remembering moving from the why question to the what or how. So what do I really want to do? And what do I want to do right now? And, you know, how can I do that? And even when can I do that can be useful. Uh, and these are just some other questions. What emotion is the other person feeling right now? I may get it wrong, but at least I'm attempting to have some social interaction or at least I'm having some emotional, trying to connect with them emotionally. How can I show genuine interest? So maybe ask them a slightly deeper question rather than expecting people to ask me this. How can I ask them? And when can I ask for help? And self-regulation. And I know I've, I've been in a relationship since 1997. We all know, and I have a crazy dog, okay? Like I have a crazy, that's a lovely thing, but she's crazy. She's Spanish, she's crazy, okay? I know I have to walk out of the room occasionally, right? And when my partner says to me, just can you just leave me alone for five minutes? I better start listening. And, you know, I do not know what it's like to live with leukemia, even though I've been supporting someone with leukemia for 12 years. And I just know that. So I let them lead, but I also need to know I can't take back certain things I've said. I can take responsibility for it afterwards and I can apologize, but we all know that there is challenges around it. So ways to just lower the temperature, lowering the temperature. Exercise is very important. Someone put that in, in walking. The brain is programmed to walk. Some simple interventions to lower the temperature. Count to five as well, heard of this before. But it's actually better to count down rather than do one, two, three, four, five, like five, four, three, two, one. You're engaging the neocortex, the logical. Cinq, quatre, trois, deux, un. I speak a little bit of French. Putting in different language distracts the brain. Breathing, I say when in doubt, and I'm putting this in chant so you get this part of my typos. Breathe out first. Breathing in can actually, and really mind those shoulders. And actually, if I got you all here for just 13 more minutes, can I ask you to breathe in and make sure those shoulders stay down and then breathe out, yogic breathing. Fill up the belly. If your shoulders are going up, especially people who run, they tend to breathe all here and breathe it all up here. That actually can cause more stress and strain. So you'll also find you'll generally have tightness here and here. So Pilates can help release if you are running or doing very strenuous activity, it's actually more important really at the end just to release the shoulders, move away from athletic breathing to yogic breathing, really, and that meditative breathing is really important. You don't have to do all of these. One or two may work, not all of them, okay? I'm not prescribing you anything to do. I'm just informing you. Strength and appreciation is really important because the brain can't hold two very powerful emotions at once. Is, you know, to frame it, we've got fear, anger, sadness, and, and enjoyment, and maybe disgust. And a couple more are kind of the real strong emotions people hold on to. But um, yoga is so good. I mean, or anything like that, just breathing. Even I just do a few stretches a day, which help me with my sciatica because I know I don't look it, but I just turned 50. Compliments, keep them out of chat. But I know if I don't do certain exercises a day, my body seizes up, especially sitting down all day. I used to stand six hours a day. I'm, you know, I don't do that anymore because I'm, I'm delivering from a couch. I'm coaching from a couch. So um, survey the landscape. Um, this is a really important idea. I just like you all to think about, especially when we're on computers. When we get really emotional, we get myopic. So we get very nearsighted. So the brain comes in, right? It narrows in and, and just focuses on one or two things, okay? And there's some good stuff around that and you can look at, right? But it's, you know, it's myopic. We, we go in the, down like this, we pan in. So I want you to think about these screens now, especially now that we're all like this, or we're all on our phones going like this, everything's narrowing our focus. And the important thing to do is pan out and literally pan out. And this is a concept that I want you to think about. Look around you and look in widescreen, okay? Not in portraits. 
widescreen. What's going on around me? What's, what's really happening? Let's give yourself and the situation some context. What are the triggers here? What are the things that constantly get me? And now start to think about what do I need to do immediately and in the future, okay? That's a really important, really go into widescreen. Yes, and this is just an idea. These are just ideas. That's why that light bulb showing up. And just some more ideas and you know, some more light bulbs I just want to remind you of. And again, just take one. Recognize your triggers. Know your triggers. If you haven't, if you're over 30, you should know them now. Okay. Everyone's saying kids are, you know, you know, I remember what I was like with 25. I know kids are now different. I don't know why, but they are apparently. And I totally get it. But when you hit 30. You should know your triggers. And if you don't know them, those triggers are still gonna be there by 50. So deal with them when you deal with them. Use humor. Humor is very important, very important. Have a laugh, watch a comedy. Right now, the most important things are on streamers are comedy shows. And that's because we need a little laugh. When my partner got diagnosed, we watched Golden Girls for a year. And we were dealing with the trauma of a cocker spaniel, and we didn't know if he was going to, you know, what was going to happen in the first year. But we literally watched Golden Girls, whether you love him or hate him, we didn't care. We didn't even watch it half the time. It was just so nice to have a laugh. Six seconds breath, and I want you to do this right now. I'm going to ask you for six seconds of your life. I want you to breathe for six seconds. Where's the tension? Where is it? Because I tell you, if I was in a room with you and I stared you directly in the eye and we kept breathing, first of all, people would start getting weirded out. They go, why is this guy staring at me? But if I sat in a room with you and I held really strong eye contact with you and, and you didn't look away, I guarantee within 30 seconds, many of you would be crying. And I'm not saying I can do that to you. I'm not going to, you know, Paul Daniels you and do some magic tricks with you. I really want you to settle into your life and settle into your emotions. And it's okay to cry. And I don't care. I see some guys here. I see you guys crying on the terraces all the time. So you big blokey English guys who say that you're hard as nails, you're not. Because I know you. And actually in many ways in Britain, men are actually, and women, I see you weeping. I see you doing that. And that's a real gift that you have in your culture here. You don't get this in North America. You know, we just get around a barbecue and scream and yell and eat carbohydrates and eat a bag of sugar. But I do, yeah, thank you for laughing, Mary. I saw that laugh, right? <laughs> I'm working hard here, people. I do want you to think about humor is really important, but your emotions are really important. So take six seconds. That was only six seconds. Right, and it's okay to release it. Seven Eleven breathing, it's another thing we can do right now. I said, when in doubt, breathe out, breathe out for just seven seconds, or really force that air out, and then breathe in for 11. I have asthma, so no excuses. Okay, this is about stopping the stimulation of the brain stem. Please don't pass out on me, all that stuff. But I'm just gonna um, clap my hands when I do. I want you to breathe out for seven seconds, no matter where you are in that breath. If you pass out, apologies in advance. But just breathe normally, settle into the breathing because breathing will always give you insight into your emotional state. So just breathe and I'm gonna clap my hands in a second. So it will be loud. Breathe out, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now in for 11. It's a lot harder. Slowly top up. Mind the shoulders, keep the shoulders down. When you need to exhale, just exhale, but let that air in. You can flip it, you can breathe out for 11, in for seven, doesn't matter. All I want you to do is intervene through breathing. We see it so many times, but it's about being present. And really what's important, I want you to think about this, and this is something to really think about, it helped me enormously. All negative thoughts, all negative thoughts, are non-present thoughts. And I want, that's your homework. If you wanna take anything away from this. Whenever you think about negative thoughts, whenever they creep in, you're not in the here and now. You're projecting yourself into an imaginary future. You're time traveling, you're becoming Mr. Doctor Who. Or you're bringing up a past. 
but it's not in the here and now. So by intervening, and, and trust me, the only way I'm reasonably good at this stuff is I coach it at least twice a week. So share this work with people you love, observe it in other people. But remember, negative thinking is non-present thinking. You have the power, you have the skill because you've already demonstrated it through the work that you do. Feeling guilty is not gonna help unless you're doing a criminal offense. Sorry, my father was a doctorate in X, Y, and Z. And this is his favorite saying, he go, Paul, who'd you kill this week? I'm like, no one, dad. Did you steal anything from a shop? I was like, nothing I care to admit. And he's like, what do you feel guilty about? He said, did you lead with kindness? Did you lead with kindness? And these are my two rules for life, kindness or consideration. Did you lead with kindness? And were you courageous? And interestingly enough, research shows that's where the big regrets for most people live. They always say, I could have been kinder and I could have had more courage. So if you lead with consideration or compassion or kindness, whatever you want to call it, and you lead with courage, you're going to be all right. And that's really a great way that I really use. And these bumper stickers, chuck them in the bin if they don't work for you. These are just ideas. Because really what you can do is you can start mapping it out. A really simple tool you can do with kids. If you're a really good parent, you can ask your kids to do this on you. And, say, and they can say, give you a report card on it. This is a great way of teaching young people about emotional resilience, but you can you lose, use it on yourself. I know that maybe I'm a really good at um, self-regulation, right? So I'm gonna score myself an eight there. If you're really good, really high, and I know I'm a star, right? Uh, but maybe with social skills, some days I don't wanna talk to people. People don't really care. And actually I'm not motivated. I don't wanna do all that stuff. So that's maybe an area of development. Then uh, self-awareness, I'm okay at it, depending on the situation. And this will fluctuate in certain situations. And empathy, I'm all right at it. And then all you do is just map it around. Now I can stretch, but I also know I'm a bit of a star here, right? So I'm pretty good at this. But also maybe I need to, certain points, just start to do maybe one thing I don't wanna do, maybe start that. Sorry, I've got a delivery coming, that wasn't me. Um, if you heard my buzzer. Sorry, bad humor. But this is just a map you can do. It's just called the Emotional Resilience Web. And it's just a way of mapping across some ways that you could develop yourself and also coach yourself or at least get a little structure to it. And it's a bit more creative and a nice little map that you can use. And we just call it a web because we all have days that we're gonna be better in other areas. And this just helps us around this. And it's just a, an idea that you can take away and use. We're just coming to the last sort of few minutes, actually. Um, briefly, this is some interventions you can use. This comes from the University of Surrey. I don't know if any of you have seen this, but it's used in palliative care. I use it a lot as a facilitator in corporations and businesses. Um, if I need to intervene with someone, what you can do, the top three are what are called autocratic, where I lead it. Um, so I, you know, I tell someone what to do or maybe get them some information and they go away and get some resources uh, or I challenge and confront some ideas, which of course you're going to have to do at times, but you do it more diplomatically. Cathartic is allowing people to express emotions. Catalytic is uh, about bringing on change, but exploring different options through the change process. Um, so you get to say with leukemia about, you know, you, you are going to lose your hair. So let's take a look at um, how we can support you through that. That'd be much more catalytic rather than just informing and valuing, thanking people, acknowledging people. And all this can just help you develop um, your emotional resilience. So before you shoot off, if you've got some time, because just I know um, Emma was saying we've got to jump into another session. If you have an idea of one or two things that you want to take away, then put it in the chat and, you know, really make a commitment to you and all these witnesses, you know, whether it's looking at your, for the framework, there's some resources here through Shine, there's a closed Facebook group that you can join as well. Uh, also, there's a really nice publication by uh, Macmillan about looking after someone with cancer. You can find it on their website as well. You're more than welcome to download or these slides or uh, go into SlideShare and find me. Again, my name is Paul and my last name is Dubois, but you can also find me on LinkedIn. I love linking in with people. Um, and if you've got any questions, I'm more than happy for people to contact me as well. Um, again, best probably to get me through um, LinkedIn, but you know, if there's a couple actions people have, um, yeah, so I've just hopefully let you know about how you can pick up these slides. 
And um, yeah, it's seven o'clock in London. So uh, Emma, I'm not sure if you have anything else you would like to add or anything you'd like to say before we end the session, because I know we have to go into another, uh, you have to go into another event. I, we do, unfortunately. I've just, I was struggling then to unmute myself, but I think I've done it, but um, <laughs> sorry about that. That's but, all right. um, Let's put that up yeah, we do. We have an, another, another, we're okay for about one minute. So we can go one yeah. or two minutes over. We won't get thrown out. But um, I just wanted to say thank you so much to Paul for, um, for running that session for us. And I think, um, I, you know, we, I've obviously worked with you before, Paul, and, and seen some of your slides, but every time I pick up something new um, and I um, maybe learn something else about myself that, um, maybe I need to work on uh, a well, bit if you, can, so, if you wanna, feel free to let me know if there's anything I need to work on because I'm always up for it. <laughs> Whether I, and this is the whole thing about this, you know, you can get the tools and we were talking about this before everyone came on. You can have the tools, it's the skills that's the problem and take the action. But I always say just to focus on one area, like make it easy on yourself, especially like, you know, supporting someone and the, the you know, the challenges of 2020 anyway but you know thank you for that Emma. i really appreciate that and do um everyone i'm just quickly i'll just put my email address in there but um you know you can just look me up online but you know just feel free to give me an email and apropos ltd.net info at um is always good but um uh, yeah and and also if you want a quick five to 10 15 minute chat feel free to hit me up i'm if i'm not working i'm happy to have a quick chat with people because it's not easy um Thanks, Paul. And I think um, I think a lot of you, I recognize your names and I think a lot of you are in the Shine um, Plus One's Facebook group. If you're not and you can't find it, then um, just drop me or whoever Shine email address you've got, um, drop them an email. It's on there as well. But look, you can go through the website. My email is emma at shinecancersupport.org. Um, so you can always drop me a line if you're trying to find something. But that way, um, you know, maybe one of you might want to start a conversation in there tonight and then you can um, have a chat about what you've learned or, you know, mm. share what you're going to do this week. Yeah. Um, share the work as well. Share those that. resources. So, yeah. Yeah. Share absolutely. the frameworks. Yeah. They're there. They're and for I, everyone to share. Sorry, Emma. That's right. No, that's I was just going to say, I'll put your details in the Facebook group as well. And then um, yeah. people can find you on LinkedIn and um, get the oh, slides and everything. Yeah. So, yeah, SlideShare um, is quite useful just because it's an easy way to download stuff. But yeah, sorry, Emma, I keep interrupting you, but no, it's just right. I'm so excited. It's so excited. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was lovely to see everyone. And I'm sorry, these hours just go like that. So, um, yeah, hopefully you can carry on the conversation in the Facebook group or um, through uh, linking in in other ways with the rest of the rest of Shine Connect as well. But thank you for giving us your evening. Um, thank you again, Paul, and um, well done everyone for, um, for joining in.